Uh, our next uh, speaker, we'll have a time for discussion at the end, but our next speaker is Professor Yaron Ezrahi. Uh, professor Ezrahi is an Israeli political theorist and an emeritus professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is also a senior fellow emeritus at the Israeli Democracy Institute in Jerusalem. Professor Ezrahi is known for his work on the relations between modern science and the rise of modern liberal democratic state and the political uses of scientific knowledge and authority. His latest work focuses on the deterioration of the Enlightenment version of the partnership between science, technology, and democracy, and the changing parameters of postmodern imaginaries and performances of the democratic order. Among his books, there are many, The Descent of the Ikaru Science and the Transformation of Contemporary Democracy. Uh, second book, Technology, Pessimism, and Postmodernism. Uh, Rubbers, Bullets, uh, Power, and Conscience in Modern Israel. And the forthcoming book, which uh, we're all expecting, uh, with Professor Ruta Cohen, The Voice of the Many and the Voices of the Individual in Music and uh, Politics. Uh, Professor Zahi. Lecture title is Can Democracy Survive the Alienation Between Politics and Knowledge? What do you want me to do? He wants you to speak oh, to the Okay. <coughs> First, I'm very glad to participate in a <coughs> workshop which uh, celebrates the contribution of Shai Lavi to the Safra uh, Institute. And uh, as uh, David had said yesterday, your loss is our gain in Jerusalem. <clears throat> I want to dedicate this very short piece of mine to a great scientist, philosopher, historian, and friend, Sam Schweber, who passed away a short time ago. His wife is here. And uh, it's hard for me to imagine the future without his smile and intellect. Okay, so this lecture is a simple, uh, very, probably some people will say it's a very natural follow-up to the former discussion. From peace to politics. From urine to politics. <laughs> <coughs> uh, Plato's idea of the reign of knowledge served many centuries as a justification for hierarchy. The Enlightenment vision of democracy was largely an attempt to democratize Plato's um, uh, regime of philosopher's king by the democratization of knowledge and making every citizen sufficiently knowledgeable to participate in self-government. The massive movement to create encyclopedias, dictionaries, promote free education were intended to educate the people, the sovereign, for the task of self-government. The idea of governors instructed by knowledge and accountable to an enlightened public encouraged the expectations of a polity run by consensus. Of course, This model of democracy based on popular knowledge on a multitude of many philosopher kings was never fully realized, although some Western countries tried from time to time to approximate it. As we shall see, the failure stemmed from a number of reasons the most important of which is first, the false belief that scientific or expert knowledge remains neutral in a divisive political context where it can resolve conflicts of interest and opinion. The second is the fact that politicians learn very quickly to turn the authority of science into a political resource while at the same time ignoring the component of knowledge on which this scientific authority rests. Whereas the educational and cultural developments, mostly in Western democratic societies, 
generated a segment of enlightened public, the larger public has remained more vulnerable to shifting moods, illusions, and prejudices. At the end, of knowledge and politics have remained mainly a matter of the relations between the scientific community and the state, scientists and politicians. Here, the record shows constant tensions and conflict, conflicting trends. In a research published in, nine, published in 1966, Joseph Haberer showed that both authoritarian and democratic societies, in both of them, scientific communities negotiated with the state the boundaries of their autonomy in return for accommodations for the needs of government, both in times of war and in time of peace. In the US, President Lyndon Johnston, for example, cut the budget of basic research as a penalty for academic research and criticism of the Vietnam War. Since the late 60s, another example, research in the possible links between the average IQ of different groups and their genetic profile was severely um, uh, restricted, both in the Soviet Union and was equally tabooed as a basis of educational policy in the United States of America, where it was widely believed that education can boost the IQ of blacks and other minorities. Another source of tension between science and government has been the revolutionary character of the development of knowledge. Um, its inherent unpredictability in the long run and the character of science succinctly described by the late sociologist of science, Robert Merton, as a form of organized skepticism. Even as a methodological norm, a culture of criticism and skepticism, short on stable truths, has largely appeared antagonistic to political culture animated by promises, hopes, and illusions. The idea of progress that formerly served as a bridge between scientists and politicians gradually waned towards the end of the 20th century. In time, the expectation that government would base their public policy on scientifically certified evidence and politicians will be empowered to serve the people by factoring knowledge into the pursuit of their political goals totally failed. It failed to predict what would actually happen. This is the crucial point, I think, of my paper. What actually happened when knowledge meets power? When power has to be adjusted to opportunities and restrictions dictated even by not absolutely certain knowledge. When that encounter, encounter started to take place, two things happened simultaneously. First, politicians learned very quickly to split the authority of science from its basis in knowledge using the shell of science which, while gleefully liberating themselves from the strictures imposed by scientifically certified contents. Second, and more importantly, the authority of science was used to empower, to empower decision makers, not by infusing knowledge into their decisions, but by relinquishing the responsibility through the depoliticization and dep personalization of politically controversial decisions. Excuse me for the many depot, depot. That uses of the authority 
of, expert, of experts to ground and justify what has in fact been political choices actually removed the experts from the political arena and the public eye, blocking potential citizens' political input. In most cases, the meeting of knowledge with power, which was intended, in fact, to rationalize policy, did not contribute so much to inform public policy as to exercising hidden political power while blinding the public to concealed underlying political choices. What was initially envisioned as knowledge to empower politicians to serve the public ended up as a, the use of scientific authority to disempower the public. In other words, that politicizing government decisions actually meant impoverishing the political participation of the citizens. The apparent or rather deceptive shift of the political grounds for public policy to the seeming courts of expert knowledge, ironically, some will say tragically, led to the people's gradual abandonment of the agora. The vision of enlightenment democracy was not a vision of empty, silent agora, of political choices made above the people's heads under cover of objective knowledge. It was more a vision of a noisy agora, where a multitude of voices are fused to produce trends. Even when democratic theories gave up their faith in coherent public opinion, both theorists and practitioners show resp showed respect for discernible shifts in public, uh, uh, in, public uh, in the public moods and tendencies. As soon as was soon recognized, when the truth about expertise as a cover-up for politics was exposed, public revolt against both experts and government became inevitable. Perhaps the most dramatic illustration has been the case of the rise and fall of economics and with it, the supposedly objective non-partisan non status of economic advice. As a discipline, economics enjoyed for a long time the privileged reputation of the most scientific of the social sciences. The mathematifiability of many areas of economics its highly abstract theories and models, its assumed capacity for macroeconomic predictions of future states of the economy, and its applicability to the running of the national economy gave economic scientists an extraordinary authority, comparable to some extent to the authority of physicists in the era, uh, area of weapons development. Moreover, the dominant economist's imaginary of the market as a kind of neutral self-regulating mechanism which should be protected from politics and from state bureaucracy projected a thoroughly false conception of the market as a value-free and hence irrelevant to moral choices. My British colleague, professor of political theory, John Dunn, observed, I quote, the market economy is the most powerful mechanism for dismantling equality that humans have ever fashioned. I hope there is no economist here, because uh, then I should have been my bodyguard. Uh, the faith, perceptions, 
and assumptions that supported the elevation of the market to the status of supreme regulator of the economy combined to produce a massive denial of the role of the whole complex of economics, including economic advice, in the political process. This denial created, bl uh, uh, concealed bl the blind, uh, concealed behind the garments of economics, the operations of a political power in the distribution and redistribution of risks, assets, and opportunities. When major economic crises and leading self-critical political economists exposed lately the actual politicization of economics, the discipline had to face significant loss of lay trust. I will not present here the analogous case of technology and the authority crisis of engineers. Suffice for our purpose is to juxtapose here the early faith in the ethical and political neutrality of economics with the faith held in the 19th century by engineers, and I quote, that since the actions of the engineer are checked at every point by the immutable laws of God and nature, there is no chance of undetected malfeasance. Also, currently, also, in this, uh, currently, also, this arrogant faith disappeared in our time with the increasing tendency to subject the developments of technologies like automation, atomic reactors, and genetic engineering to fierce ethical and political assessment. Perhaps a particularly telling expression of public alienation from knowledge was expressed in America, uh, expressed in an American rapper's site named The Evil Empire that warns against attempts to scare the masses by media manipulations. This rapper seemed to highlight what he calls, listen to this, I think this is an incredible insight to what happened later with Trump. He highlight what he calls the charisma of ignorance as a com com commendable condition. Clearly, in our time, the solidarity of unknow unknowable majorities forms a powerful democratic opposition. It is still very democratic to elites of knowledgeable minorities. The pursuit of excellence becomes an aristocratic virtue and scientific innovations as potentially destabilizing entrenched modes of existence. In such an atmosphere, the charisma of ignorance is a defense of the dignity and the political rights of uneducated laypersons. It is posed as countering the dignity and superior influence of elites of men and women of knowledge. Given these conditions, the near future of democracy doesn't seem to depend or re on return to the maximalist vision of knowledge-based politics of the Enlightenment. Perhaps it should derive its new approach and inspiration from the pre-modern concept of wisdom as a social judgment 
that combines informal knowledge and codified knowledge and values over the knowledge of experts. More specifically, instead of trying to restore the hierarchical authority of experts, we should repair the crisis of common sense, repair the crisis of common sense, which has been broken by the spread of social and political distrusts in claims of facts, claims of causality and objectivity, just because they do not live up to the level of certainty or validity of already discredited experts. We must recognize that the imaginary of democracy requires interactive social rather than scientific production of politically relevant notions of facts, causality, and objectivity as necessary components of democratic process of government. We don't use in democratic political processes scientific concepts of facts and causality. So what we need is, I repeat, interactive social rather than scientific production of politically relevant notions of facts, of causality, and objectivity as necessary components of democratic processes of government participation and legitimation. Post-enlightenment democracy must more fully and consciously shift from the co-production of scientific knowledge and rational politics for these ideals to the co-production of socially interactive networks of shared context-bound common sense knowledge and a political order in a constant, constant state of flux and ceaseless becoming. <coughs> we should move on to shared conceptions of political reality as a flow that fuses diverse voices and desires. The business of democratic politics is not the pursuit of philosophical or scientific truth but of self-direction of collectives capable of self-imposed constraints and horizontal accountabilities. Horizontal accountabilities is a key here, and I develop it in my latest book, which is still in the making. In my opinion, there are three main ways to have to save politics from using the authority of knowledge to depoliticize collective decisions and abuse the democratic process. First, we can repair common sense from the radical erosion of shared perceptions of how things work. This can be supported by the direct diffusion of expert knowledge, but not by the direction excuse me, not by the direct diffusion of expert knowledge, but by the dem domestication, by the domestication and the contextualization of expert knowledge by mediators of the kind indicated by Don K. Price, reference to what he called the scientific affairs community, a community of people who feel at home in both the domains of knowledge and politics. Such people have the skill of to, to met metabolize knowledge in the stream of politics. Second, Joshua Ober, a historian of ancient Greece, draws valuable insights from the earlier democratic rejection of the platonic distinction between episteme and doxa in the context of public affairs and its substitution by reliance on social networks of knowledge acquired by practice and experience. Obviously, the scale of Athens of the fifth century BC is too small to encourage an analogy to contemporary multi-million polities. Whereas the, whereas the electronic web that, domi that dominates large-scale social interaction in our time has been vastly abused, 
It offers, nevertheless, a great opportunity of social networks that can both domesticate and diffuse politically relevant knowledge on a large scale. Ober observes aptly that the formation of public policy can be greatly assisted by, quote, politically relevant knowledge, knowledge which consists of people beliefs, capabilities, experience, and information organized in ways that can be reproduced and shared among collectives. The interaction of social and technical aspects of politically relevant knowledge within uh, the context of democratic institutions, very important, the context of institution that in introduces a certain kind of structure, produces better and more acceptable decisions. Thirdly, finally, the third significant alternative to top-down transmission of formal knowledge is the informal horizontal transmission of what Michael Polanyi conceptualized in 1966 as tacit knowledge. The tacit knowledge is more a knowledge of know-how than of know what and why, like the knowledge of how to ride bicycle, which is acquired by practice. Uh, Goffin argues that for tacit knowledge to be transferred, it requires extensive social contact, to contact, regular interactions, and trust. Practical instrumental knowledge of political know-how can be transmitted through social networks with a community, within a community of political practice. It can be supported also by simple, accessible manuals like those which instruct us how to maintain our cars or cultivate our gardens. In many of his studies, sociologist Bruno Latour has shown how science is made often by continual interactions of people and non-human elements guided by uncodified tacit knowledge and intuitive or common sense judgments of how to usefully combine text, operation, things, context, language, and actions. While necessar with, ne with necessary qualification, the challenge of renewing contemporary democratic politics is analogous to how to make politics by fusing multiple voices and negotiating rotating orders of values and actions in the context of constantly renewed network of informal knowledge. Such networks could horizontally replicate political skills of effective criticism and protest. These processes would be effective, however, only by implying or employing available and future technology to create a large collective workshop to the ongoing production of democratic process of government. All three strategies for welding interactive knowledge, shared and competing social values and common sense. None of them faces the danger of using expert knowledge authority as a gloss over hidden, similarly depoliticized deployments of power. Such possibilities of coping with the alienation of democracy from knowledge are widely available in relatively cemented communities but unfortunately less so in radically individualistic liberal democracies. Still, the future of democracy, in my opinion, lies not in restoring the reign of knowledge and the hierarchical authority of experts, nor in the cult of the charisma of ignorance. It is, it lies rather in repairing and empowering our common sense as the inclusive epistemological and moral arena of democratic politics. Thank you. Thank you very much.